As we start the new year, there are new health concerns across the country, most notably for children. Yesterday, the CDC changed its routine childhood vaccine schedule. Instead of 18 recommended vaccines, there are now just 11. This is the largest change in the U.S. vaccine guidance in decades. The White House is praising the change, with the president saying, quote, we are moving to a far more reasonable schedule where all children will only be recommended to receive vaccinations for 11 of the most dangerous diseases. Parents can still choose to give their children all of the vaccinations if they wish, and they will still be covered by insurance. Despite the federal government touting these plans, some health care providers are concerned this could lead to the spread of disease. Joining us live now with her insight, Dr. Yvonne Maldonado, a leader in pediatric infectious diseases at Stanford University. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So let's start off. Can you walk us through exactly what changed? We mentioned it a little bit here off the top. Which vaccines remain on the recommended schedule? Well, let me just say from the top that um, generally we have a slate of 17 vaccines that are recommended for children to take in their first five years of life. And there's a whole series for each one. These are highly safe and effective regimens. They've been shown to save thousands of lives every year. Um, in kids in the United States. And what's happened here is that six to seven of the vaccines, depending on how you look at them, have been moved down either from the recommended list to either the high risk category only or to something called shared clinical decision making, which means you can talk to your doctor about them and decide if you want to take them or not. Now, even though the government says these will be available, and paid for. We don't know the operational nature of that, whether that's actually true, whether some states will be uh, able to afford to cover these or not, whether the federal government will cover the costs and insurance companies. So it's not as easy and uncomplicated as it seems. And the statement that the most dangerous diseases will be covered means that there are other dangerous diseases that won't be absolutely recommended. And so parents always have a choice right now. Nothing is mandated. These are recommended vaccinations. Um, but so now this will mean that people will be more confused. Their, their, their uh, decision making will involve talking to their pediatrician, maybe an extra step in paperwork. So we don't really know what this means on an operational level, but we do know that it'll add more confusion to parents who want to decide what to do best for their children. Yeah, and let's talk about those specific vaccines and why it all matters from a public health standpoint. Yeah, so um, I, I just want to highlight two of the vaccines um, because we don't have a lot of time here. But of the 10 that are still uh, approved and recommended, those are really serious infections. But the other seven are also very serious and can lead to hospitalizations and deaths as well in children. Um, two of them, RSV and influenza, are respiratory diseases. They are annual pandemic diseases. That means they go around the world every single year. And there are approved vaccines and antibodies to protect against uh, RSV and vaccines against flu, but you need to get those on a regular basis because the immunity doesn't last a long time. RSV is the number one cause, number one cause of hospitalizations in children under two years of age in the United States. And 80% of the children who are hospitalized do not have underlying risk factors. So this disease is now relegated to a risk-based only or a shared clinical decision-making, which means if you opt out, you, you may be led to believe that it's not as important for your healthy child, but we don't have any way of knowing which child will be at risk for being hospitalized or even dying from this disease. The same is true for influenza. And the other diseases as well um, are going to be put at risk of, uh, of really starting to resurge in this country if we start seeing lower vaccination rates. And major medical groups are pushing back against the changes. What are you hearing from colleagues? Well, the American Academy of Pediatrics has been making vaccine recommendations to the United States uh, for over almost 100 years now. We more than the federal government has. The CDC began the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices in the 1960s. So the AAP has been doing this for much longer. They have a very rigorous approach to reviewing the data and they I recommend, and all of their 67,000 pediatricians are recommended to continue using the existing schedule that was in place before uh, 2025. And so that is what most pediatricians, most public health officials, um, and most state health departments are recommending at this time.
All right, Dr. Maldonado, we want to get this to parents. If they're all sitting there trying to make sense of this all, the big takeaway, I'm sure it's ask questions too. Yeah, absolutely. I think at the end of the day, what we really want to do is make sure that parents um, are not confused about what to do for their children. Uh, it is important for them to continue to, to go to their pediatric or healthcare providers, ask the questions that they need to ask, and make sure that they understand that the American Academy of Pediatrics is backing up all pediatricians and all children and families to make sure that they get the right treatment and care, not just for vaccines, but for the overall health of their children. Those are the most reliable sources at this time until we can get more reliable information from the federal government. All right, Dr. Maldonado, thank you so much for your expertise and your time on this topic today. We appreciate it.